uh, on this New Year's for the Year of the Ox. It's great to see you all here, um, led by this perseverant animal. Hopefully this will be a year of, of stability and peace as we go forward uh, into a vaccine, uh, vaccinated population on this, on this world. We all can go back to life as normal. I am delighted to report that we have reservations tonight exceeding 200 screens from clay devotees uh, from at least 15 states that I can figure out, five countries, including Japan, Israel, Canada, and England, uh, a few journalists and academicians and several museum curators. Tonight, I am welcoming three great friends of ridiculously long-standing that I cannot count the years to talk to all of you about the joys of ceramics, both the process as well as the collecting. It's an addiction for so many of you here today. Following a friendship of more than three decades, it's with tremendous excitement that I'm able to collaborate at long last with my wonderful friend, Jeff Shapiro on our very special virtual exhibition of his new sculptural work. Uh, we met many decades ago at an early exhibition at his familial home in New Rochelle. And I was already intrigued myself with Japanese ceramics and had collected um, some work by Japanese artists uh, during travels to Japan, but this was not uh, part of my business as a private dealer in Japanese art. And of course, as most of you know, that focus pivoted completely more than 25 years ago. And uh, Japanese clay art has become my major pursuit and passion. And in fact, Jeff was actually instrumental in that in, a, in some way by introducing me many, many decades ago when in Tokyo at the same time to the young Kuroda Koji who, with whom he was exhibiting and who has now become one of the most important colleagues uh, that I have for my gallery. I in turn at that time introduced him to another gallerist and supporter from Osaka. So in many ways, his career and my career have been inter intertwined for decades and often punctuated by surprise sightings of one another uh, when touring in Japan with our, our friends and supporters. Through the decades uh, and many exhibitions, both in the US and Japan, I have followed Jeff's career with admiration, happily acquiring works from my own home here and there. And um, from those early days as an avid follower of the Bizen tradition and technique to his current very independent, highly personal new work, his course of development has been inspiring for me to witness. So despite my gallery rule to handle only the clay art made by Japanese artists, I believe this new body of work to be so compelling, so dramatic and so uh, evocative that I had to make it available to my own clientele who at least I thought were very Japanese focused. So it's with great pleasure that I introduced this new series of Cascades and Glacial Landscapes to our virtual online uh, audience and also uh, via our catalog that you can download from our website. So for tonight's event, I thought it would be more than appropriate, in fact, absolutely mandatory, that my dear friends, clients, and fellow addicts, uh, who are also longtime fans of Jeff, both as an artist and a friend, join us this evening to offer their insights into the world of clay, both in the West and Japan. I am most grateful to Halsey and Alice North that they immediately accepted my invitation. And I am confident that all of you tonight will be both entertained and, education, and educated by the uh, commentary that's ahead of you. So let me give a more formal introduction of our participants so you know a bit about their credentials. So we can have the next slide, yeah. Uh, Jeff Shapiro was born in the Bronx in 1949 and was drawn to Japan to study ceramic art. He remained there for nine years from 1973 to 1981. And during that period, he studied with a number of Japanese potters from different re mm -hmm. regions ending up in the newly built studio of an apprentice of the living national treasure Isazaki Jun, 
And actually, I believe his son is with us tonight, uh, who was one of Jeff's apprentices many, many years later. Upon returning to the US in 1981, uh, Jeff began building his own Anagama and his studio in upstate New York, uh, where he lives today with his gorgeous wife, Hinako. His inaugural series of Anagama firing was uh, in 1984. And over the past 35 years, Jeff has exhibited really all over the globe, in Europe, Australia, North America, and of course, Japan. He has twice exhibited in Germany with his mentor, Isizaki Jun, and in a three-person show with the renowned French artist, Claude Champy, and the equally renowned uh, Suji Murashiro. And that show uh, was seen on three continents. Over the past decade, he's had numerous solo shows with prestigious galleries throughout the United States, France, and Japan. Additionally, and equally important, Jeff has been an active, uh, played the role as teacher and has received invitations around the world to lead workshops as far apart as India, Taiwan, New Zealand, Switzerland, France, Canada, Spain, and Bali. His <laughs> artworks can be found in collections, private collections all over the world and in museum collections as well. Uh, Alison Halsey, both founding leaders of the North Group Incorporated, which helped many nonprofit organizations with fundraising, planning, and development over a 30 year career. Uh, Alice and Halsey are pioneering collectors of Japanese ceramic art and have helped to build the collection of Japanese clay art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. However, and part of the reason they are here tonight is they first started with American contemporary ceramics in 1971. And moved into the world of those made by Japanese artists 15 years later in 86. They first met Jeff at a symposium on wood-fired ceramics at Japan Society in 1987, and I was there, I remember that. And soon they were also collecting his work, leading to his engagement as leader of their 1995 ceramics tour of Japan. Currently, after more than a decade of research with Louise Court, the retired uh, curator of ceramics at the Freer Sackler, uh, next year they are about to publish their really exciting book titled Listening to the Clay, Conversations with Contemporary Japanese Ceramic Artists. And truly, there are no greater cheerleaders for this field than Alice and Halsey. So thank you, th all three friends, for being with us here tonight. And uh, our format is that I will act as moderator and ask questions of all of our participants, after which time allowing, uh, we have some questions that have already been submitted. And if we have time, we will open the floor for questions via the chat function. So as we're going along, if any of you have questions, feel free to type them in on the chat function. So my first question, is to Jeff. So Jeff, as uh, Japan was not a well-known or popular destination from Americans in the 1970s, what drew you to go there in the first place? In such a highly structured society, how did you manage to get situated, accepted, and also become conversant in both the language and the culture? And specific to ceramic art, who in Japan was most important in launching your career? At first, I just wanted to thank you, Joan, and the whole gallery team for all this hard work that you put into this, the exhibition and the catalog and this Zoom panel. Um, it's been a real pleasure the whole time working with all of you. Um, and I want to thank you particularly for having enough confidence in my work to give me the opportunity to show these two bodies of sculpture. I realized that it is quite a, a departure for the gallery. And for that, I feel appreciative and quite pleased with the response so far. So I'd also like to thank Judy Schwartz for writing the essay for the catalog. Um, I hope that you all have a chance to take a look at that when you can. And to Allison Halsey North for participating in the Zoom session. So as far as your question, Joan, well, 
And let me just say one thing. When Joan mentioned in the beginning that we had these uh, serendipitous meetings over these decades, I think the one particular she might have been referring to was when we met eye to eye as I was walking through the tunnel on the way to the Miho Museum, and she was actually returning of all places in the world to run into each other. It was, uh, it was quite something. Um, but as far as your question, uh, originally, I went to Japan to study of all things martial arts. So it wasn't until I actually visited Bizen, the town of Imbe, which is one of the six uh, ancient kiln sites uh, that I decided to make this my career. So I spent the first two and a half years in Kyoto studying Japanese language and learning to appreciate the culture in general. And Kyoto was just a, a wonderful place to be as a curious 23 year old. And I had a number of experiences during the nine years living in Japan um, with different teachers and different studios. And one of those very early ones was with Takatori Seizan uh, in Kyushu. And she was an 11th generation potter, a descendant from a Korean pottery family. Um, and that's where I gained an appreciation for nature in general and natural processes like using wood-fired kiln hand processing clay, throwing on kick wheels. Um, but the actual epiphany for me happened in Bizen when I had the opportunity to visit Isazaki Jun <coughs> in this picture here, who is now living national treasure. This is many years ago before he was designated that title. But he invited me back to participate in a 10 day long firing of his wood kiln. And maybe it was the romanticism of it all the smell of the wood, the uh, rustic environment, and of course the surfaces um, that I was mm. seeing coming from this wood kiln that I've never seen before. Um, but when I saw those, I was hooked. And I think it was also something to do with the whole town of Bizen, this town that had maybe 250, 300 kilns, large kilns, wood, wood burning kilns, um, dedicated to the industry of clay and ceramics. It, really struck me more than just the work itself, uh, more as a, a lifestyle. Um, June became a mentor of mine. I didn't study with June, but I would go back often for discussions and he was a very important mentor. And now at 84 years old, he's actually making some of the strongest work of his life, I believe. Uh, and to me, that's incredibly inspiring. Think about that. And his son Koichiro, who is also in this image, uh, came to work in my studio for two years. And since returning to Japan a number of years ago, he's found his own voice and he's making some beautiful work. And I'm always so happy to see that. Uh, there's another person, if we can go to the next picture, um, Takahara Shoji. This is an image of Halsey and Takahara. Um, Takahara Shoji was another mentor of mine from Bizen. I had a number of mentors from throughout Japan but another mentor from Bizen. And through visiting his studio, <clears throat> conversations with he and his wife and uh, watching kiln firings, talking about loading in particular, he had an amazing way of, of loading the beautiful clay that he used and got incredible effects in the ends of the firings. This was a, a Bizen Yakishime, wood-fired unglazed platter. Um, and there's a, a small anecdote, but uh, let me just bring you up to date before the anecdote. There's a particular reverence for materials in Japan. So Bizen clay is comprised of basically two kinds. There's the smooth clay. It's a black waxy clay that comes from underneath the rice fields. It used to be hand dug cubes and sold to the potters. And then there's a grainier, sandier, stonier clay that comes from the stream sides or the hills. Um, <laughs> and the clay character in any of the Yakishime kiln sites, Bizen, Shigaraki, Iga, all of them, all of the six, it's the clay character that stands out and makes a, a difference and separates it from all the others. Um, so this is called Tsuchi Aji, that's the clay character. And the anecdote about uh, Takara-san, and I'll leave it up to you to decide what it means, is that when he was 20, he in his 20s, he had finished studying with 
Isazaki Jun's father, Isazaki Yozan. And he had just enough money to purchase a piece of property and build a kiln, the studio in his humble house. And right after that, it was discovered a very important clay deposit in the Bizen area. And he went to test it and realized how good it was <clears throat> and knew that he had to have this clay, but he didn't have much money. So he did whatever he could to get a hold of a, a fair amount of it and store it underneath the train tracks nearby his home. And he told himself, because he was only in his late 20s, that he wouldn't be producing his best work yet. So he told himself he would only allow himself to use 20% of this great clay in his clay composition, but that when he turned 60, when he should be at his prime, he would allow himself as his 60th birthday to switch the proportion from 80, 20 to 80% of this really great clay. The bottom line of this is that unfortunately he passed away at 59 and a half. So I go over this a lot in my mind in terms of what that means, but the reverence for clay never changed. Um, and as far as other mentors, another person, if we can go to the next slide, I believe, Suji Seime, who's passed away quite a while ago now, he was another very important mentor to me. I was fortunate to have the relationship with Suji Seime and his wife, the potter Suji Kyo. Um, Suji Seime san was a, a wonderful ceramic artist. And he was able to procure all the best clays in Japan. And he often used a really good stony, full of character Shigaraki clay. And he had superior firing skills. And he had an unbridled way of expressing his creatively, creativity from his small dirt floor studio. He worked in this little nothing of a studio just outside of Tokyo. And he was also known for presenting a number of educational programs on, the, on various kiln sites in Japan on Japanese public television. So one time he happened to be at a sushi restaurant uh, in Okayama near Bizen. And he called and said, come on down. And so I came down and we were having sushi. And while we were there, a collector called to say that he had acquired a 17th century sake bottle that he was interested in showing to Seimei-san. And when he came, Seimei-san picked up the tokuri bottle and caressed it in his hands, but he had an unsatisfied look. And then he said that it was indeed a beautiful bottle, but it actually needed to have sake in it to see how it actually worked. So he told the sushi chef to clean out the bottle, 17th century, and put his best sake inside. And drinking from that lopsided bottle that had most likely fallen over in the kiln and had just the right amount of movement to give it an abundance of character, plus four centuries of age, made it just a magnificent piece to be drinking from. I'll never forget that. Seimei-san actually bought three of my first sculptures that I ever showed in Japan at Gallery Koko in Kanda in Tokyo many years ago. And I think- I have, another I have another question for you okay. before we get to that yep. slide. I just wanted to say you introduced me to Suji Seime uh, and uh, we were there together at his home uh, and uh, enjoyed an incredible nabe meal for, uh, made by his incredibly talented wife, both as a ceramicist, yeah. ceramicist and as chef. Yeah. And uh, I think of when I visit you and we enjoy Hinako's cuisine, I often think of that magical day back in 1990 something where yeah. it was formidable. And she made the best, to this date, the best umeboshi I've ever had. Right. Very yeah. Yeah, yeah, she was very, very special. So my next question to you, Jeff, is in addition to mentors and teachers, you also had a patron uh, of the arts while in Japan. And can you tell us a bit about the relationship of how that evolved and how that affected your work and your life choices as you went forward in your career? Sure. Um, can we have that next image? So this is an image of Kabumoto Nobuo. Uh, it was a very unique and special encounter I had that led to an artist patron relationship. So Kawamoto san was a businessman living on the Japan seacoast. And he actually offered me the opportunity to come and live and work under his auspices. 
And it took a while for me to realize that this was a serious offer. But once I did, I found a piece of land, actually the top part of a mountain, that Kabusan then bought for the project. And he told me later that he was actually very pleased that I had chosen this particular top of a mountain because it was part of his family's uh, property up until the war. Then after the war, during the occupation, it was taken away. And so he was very pleased to put this piece of property back into his, his land trust. Um, so he purchased this, uh, this piece of property on top of the mountain. And then he financed building a bridge. We had to cross a stream. He had to build a stone buttress road to the top of the mountain. And then I designed a simple house that he built. He was the head of a big building corporation, luckily. Um, and I designed a basic cinder block studio that he built. And then he financed my building of a small Anagama kiln. And the, the relationship and the ensuing story has turned into a, a saga. It's a memoir that I've actually been working on for almost 40 years now. And I'll be putting out some audio excerpts of the story. I fell in love with the area along the Japan seacoast and living there felt like Shangri-La. I learned by making lots of mistakes on my own. And Kabumoto-san actually became quite proficient in making pottery from visiting, visiting my studio so often. And then suddenly after three very good years, the relationship abruptly ended, as in one moment to the next. It's a long convoluted story that will be un unfolded in the memoir, but that single moment caused me to rethink my life. And at that point I decided I would return to the, to the States. But still wanting more understanding of wood firing, I took the opportunity to spend a year at the newly built studio of Yamashita Joji, who was a friend and also an apprentice of Isazaki Jun. And following that year, I, I returned uh, back to the States. Terrific, uh, obviously a seminal figure, but um, as we all know, relationships in Japan can be fleeting or they can be lifelong. And they do sometimes turn on a dime and one never knows what precipitated the break. So, um, but fortunately you had such a, a supportive an influential patron at an early stage to set you on your course. Okay, great. Halsey, you both are well known as pioneering, pioneering collectors of Japanese contemporary artists, but until a few minutes ago, most of our audience uh, does not know that your initial focus was on acquiring the works of US regional ceramicists. And through the years, you acquired, I believe, more than two dozen works by Jeff. How did you come to know his work and what attracted you to acquire such a large body of work in the first place? Okay. Um, we first started collecting ceramics, as you mentioned, uh, in 1971, when we were living as, as newlyweds in North Carolina. And uh, there was a pottery studio underneath my office that got us intrigued and started collecting. And then I became director of the North Carolina State Arts Council. And we traveled around the state and got, a lot, lot, got to know a lot of the ceramic artists, especially those connected with the Penland School of Crafts up in the mountains. Um, we moved to New York in uh, 1979, and we met Jeff at a wood-fired ceramics uh, symposium at Japan Society in 1987. And if we can have the next slide, please. Um, we had recently returned from Japan, having visited Brazil, and, and we're just, absolutely delighted to, to meet someone who was doing wood-fired work that we admired. Not only that, but he was a nice guy. He was exciting. He was good to be around. He was fun. And slide, please. We were strongly attracted. To the bold forms that he was making and the rich brown earth tones, the red highlights, resulting from the ash deposited on the kiln, as you were describing earlier, Joan. These, these kiln effects really captured our imagination. And the serendipitous nature of these kiln effects um, really were, were just joyful. And, and we started to seek them out as we, we looked at ceramics. Slide, please. So shortly after we met Jeff, 
we went up to Accord and we met Inako and enjoyed her fabulous food. We loved Jeff's uh, presentations, his pots, his storytelling. He was just so wonderful to be around. Next slide, please. And what we found over the years is that Jeff is a very generous teacher. Um, he's very knowledgeable, he's very sharing, and we just learned a tremendous amount from him. And based on that, that knowledge he gave us and, and helped us achieve over the years, we began to collect significant numbers of, of wood-fired ceramics, both American and Japanese. And these are just some of, the, some of the pieces we've collected other than Jeff's over the years. But we had many, many works by Jeff uh, as well. Um, back to you, Joan. Thank you, Halsey. Uh, that was great. I'm, lo I'm loving looking at some of these old friends here uh, and this mosaic. It's gorgeous. So that's the next question to Jeff. And my next question to you is that now you're returning to the United States in 1980. And um, uh, this is a quote from you. I believed everything must be done in the traditional way. Kick wheel, wood firing kiln, yakshime, and emphatically, no slips or glazes. This is what I studied and learned in Bizen. I now take the freedom to use whatever material, forming technique, and firing, firing method that I now feel will best serve the concept of the work I choose to make." Unquote. So what were some of the breakthrough moments at which you could feel you mm -hmm. could defy this training that you've had and depart from uh, all that you've learned from BZ? Hmm. Okay, well, that's a lot, but let me, let me see what I can do. Um, well, upon returning to the US, I found this property where we are now in the Hudson Valley. Um, this is where I still live today and living with my wife, Hinako. And she's been an inspiration in how she relates to ceramic vessels and food. Sometimes she'll see a new piece from the kiln and think what food might show best with that vessel. Or conversely, she may have a recipe in mind and then look for an appropriate serving dish. And she's also been one of my strongest critics. So I'm always being challenged in a good way. And once I was back here, there really were no teachers or mentors to ask questions anymore. So it was a matter of pretty much trial and error, lots of failures in the beginning, and questions to myself, like what's the validity of this Jewish guy in upstate New York making pottery that I learned in Japan? Who was my audience? Uh, it took a number of years to find my own voice. And surely when I first returned after spending nine whole years in Japan, I was a romanticist in my approach to pottery and even perhaps in the lifestyle. Uh, but gradually I became more of a pragmatist in how I work, expanding my parameters in, in how I work and being able to experiment with non-traditional techniques. So once this started, the pieces evolved into what I'm making today. Does that, that answer that or is there more? That answers that beautifully. And I must say, Hinako is a, an artiste in the truest sense of the word in how yeah. not only she cooks, but how she makes your plates sing. Um, Very nice. As an Nicely aside, put. but related as, uh, aside is that we're now working on our next exhibition, which is on uh, Uro Sanjin and his rivals. And there was no man who knew this concept better than Ro Sanjin. And I think he was the one who set us all on this course of the tantamount importance of the vessel and the food that's upon it. And things taste better when presented beautifully, there's no question. So uh, thank you, Hinako. Thank you, Hinako. <laughs> thank you, Hinako. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Alice, it's your turn. Next batter up. Um, you have traveled to Japan, I can't count how many times, and you've actually organized four ceramic tours uh, for Japan Society, one even led by Jeff. What brought you to change from collecting American artists to your focus on Japan? And what did you end up doing with all of the American material once you changed your focus as you were living in a New York apartment and uh, there wasn't room for everything for sure? Thank you, Joan. 
Um, we started to shift our focus from collecting American ceramics to Japanese ceramics as we got to know more and more Japanese clay artists through the ceramic tours we, we led. The ceramic tours focused on visiting clay artists in their homes and studios and sharing meals together. It was fun for the group. And here's an example of all of us at Shimoka Tatsuzo. Um, we were able to eat off of his fabulous dinnerware that you can see here. Um, Next slide. We didn't have space in our Upper West Side apartment to collect both American and Japanese ceramics. These are some of the Japanese ceramics we collected. Slide. In 2002, we renovated the apartment to add display space and to be able to entertain large groups more effectively. Uh, you can see we added shelves in front of windows. We, we added display space every place we could. Um, slide. Before the renovation started, we gave much of our American collection to the Mint Museum of Craft and Design in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we had started collecting. Slide. That opened more space to collect Japanese clay. Back to Joan. One, one thing you didn't mention is that Japanese ceramics have boxes. And I really would like it if you could tell this audience how you every single piece here has a footprint that's bigger than what that piece is. And what did you do with all of those boxes? What a wonderful question. Um, you can see a little, go, let's go back two slides. Um, so, you can see under the shelves, that's all box storage. Um, and you can see in the living room, it's just surrounded by box storage. And then we actually took the third bathroom, took out the bathtub um, and turned it into box storage. So the biggest boxes went in the, in, in the bathroom. But yes, box storage is extremely important. And obviously then we did have to buy some storage up the street and carry the boxes up and back. Thanks, Alice. Uh, box, I, I don't have a client who doesn't complain about the problem of boxes, but no one has been more creative than you and Halsey on finding ways to fill every part of your wall, inside of your walls, to make them more practical. That's great. Uh, Jeff, I'd like to turn back to you now. Um, and I want to focus on what you're doing now, since we talked so much about what you used to do. Clearly, your new body of dramatic sculpture is drawn from nature. And I would like to hear more about how the works in this exhibition were created with their incredible surface textures. Can you take us through your artistic process of creating an Oribe work and, and how that differed from the creation of an ice flow sculpture? Then could you elaborate a little bit on your journey to this new personal vision both technically and aesthetically, and how these works are the embodiment of that vision. I'll try. <laughs> um, this one is actually a very good example or sample of this, the Pug Mill series. Um, so there are basically two series that on the surface look like they're very different, but they actually have quite a bit in common, this Ori Bay series and then the Ice Flow series. So the piece we're looking now is something that evolved from coincidence. And it's often the way that I try to work is by noticing that things happen along a process. And if I don't force myself to get from A to B without allowing myself to see things in between, if I, if I don't see those things, then I just get the process completed. If I allow myself to see what's going on in between, it can open it self up to new directions of work. So this series in particular, the one that looks like the stack of plates on top of a solid plug of clay, started as a coincidence, uh, bringing clay out of the pug mill, which is a machine to rework recycled clay where it comes out as a solid plug. Uh, when I was repairing the machine, the front part of the tunnel was taken off 
and with the auger inside, it created for the first time these plate-like um, uh, this this series of pieces on top. Uh, this is all one solid piece, but it created the auger shapes on the top. And I saw these and I, and I noticed it as plates or bowls. And it immediately reminded me of the ancient kiln sites in China where pieces would be stacked um, 10, 20, 30 high. And because perhaps the kiln got a little too hot and they were glazed, they would stick together and they would be thrown off to the side of the kiln. Those are the pieces that I really want to be looking at. Those are the ones that inspire me. And this had that quality to it. So that was in the making. And then if we talk a little bit about the, the surfaces, um, the area where I'm living now in the lower Hudson Valley, it's a real gift to be able to live here. It's just so rich in, in all the natural elements. So there's beautiful pools of water. We have a stream right below us that's one of the few potable uh, water streams left. Um, magnificent looking, uh, crystal clear water, waterfalls, uh, lichen and moss um, all over. So we're very fortunate that way. And that definitely reflects back on my work and particularly in these two bodies. So right now we're just looking at the Ordi Bay. So again, the structure would be inspired from these old Chinese stacks of pots and the coloration is inspired by the surroundings of our immediate area. Um, and if we look at the next one, if we look at the ice flow, yeah. Um, the ice flow pieces, again, uh, there's some coincidence that happens here. So these, the first one was a piece that was fired in the wood kiln. So the other connection that these two series have, the similarity, even though they look very different on the surface, is that they both are from multiple firings, being that the initial firing or firings uh, were done in the wood kiln, uh, extended period of times, which gives it a chance to build up coals, embers, uh, melted and unmelted ash. On top of which, there are subsequent firings of either the Ordi Bay or this white translucent glaze. And when I'm glazing, I came to glazing very late uh, I don't think of myself as a potter glazing pots. The glaze is more three-dimensional painting. So I get to use this any way I want. So sometimes I'll layer it incredibly thick, much thicker than you'd be able to do on, a, on the walls of a, a vessel or a cup or a tea bowl. Um, and then depending how the piece is placed in the kiln, I can get it to either pool very thickly or to actually run. And when it does run and some of the pooling, it looks very much like what happens in this area when there's, for example, cut through a pass for a, a highway where the walls of, of stone are straight up and they gradually have water flowing over them. And by the end of February, beginning of March, there's this very deep, thick uh, accumulation of ice flowing. Uh, and that's what these are, are reminiscent of. Um, yeah. So this actually, in the making of this series, um, the way these happened, again, the first one was, I guess, coincidental in that I had laid clay out, thick slabs of recycled wet goppy clay on a countertop, preparing to put it through the pug mill. But for some reason, it got ahead of me and started drying out more quickly than I had expected. And it actually, the mass of clay started to develop these cracks and fissures and I started to see them as sculpture forms and started to separate them from the rest of the clay. And now this is what I do intentionally, lay the clay out, let it develop these cracks and then find the sculpture within the mass of clay. Is that good? Or That's great, <laughs> That's more... great, Jeff. I think you've articulated that incredibly well. And I uh, think our audience really has a really great sense of your uh, depth of feeling for nature and how you are able to uh, codify that or uh, represent that within your work. So now as I look at this monumental piece, I really do think about uh, a scene along the Taconic as the, the ice flow is coming down. Actually, it's kind of uh, funny because our apprentice, uh, the recent apprentice, uh, his name's Matt, he was a, before he came here, he was a rock climber. Uh, 
and uh, semi-professional rock climber. And as soon as this piece came out, he immediately imagined himself being like the size of an ant. And he immediately figured how he would make it all the way up to the top of this piece. Well, great. you have a new audience, a new audience for your work. Right, right, right. That, that's yeah. great. Terrific. Thank you, Jeff. So, so my next question is for Halsey again, please. Um, as, as we've already discussed, you, you and Alice are both sophisticated and experienced collectors of both American and Japanese clay art. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of give us a sense from your perspective how you see the overarching differences between the two? In particular, can you think about those Western artists who were trained in Japan? How would you compare Jeff's work to those of his contemporaries who've traveled a similar path? Perhaps like Warren McKenzie, who I know you knew well, Tim Rowan, Malcolm Wright, who, by the way, to our audience is having a wonderful show here in the, an actual show here in New York, right this very week at Sarah Gallery. But how, how would you put this in perspective for our audience? Okay. Um, uh, let me use these three pieces as examples. Uh, traditionally, Japanese potters have focused on achieving perfection of technique. The perfect shape, the perfect clay, the perfect glaze. And these three wonderful pieces from Kyoto are now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And they are of their types perfect in terms of technique. Now, on the other hand, slide please. American potters have often focused on the expression of emotion, sometimes at the sacrifice of technique. And here is a selection of influential American work in the National Museum of Modern Art Kyoto that came from international exhibitions of contemporary clay in 1964 and 1971. Next slide, please. And here two more pieces from the 1971 exhibition. When the Japanese artists saw these, these pieces by the Americans, they were astounded by, by the sense of freedom, the expression of emotion. They didn't know you could do this with clay because they had been focusing on technique. And so what we're finding here in the, the late 50s and then 60s, 70s, 80s, was a real period of cross-fertilization going back and forth. Uh, many of us have known about Japan's influence on American ceramic artists, but many of us had not realized the profound influence that American ceramic artists had on Japan, specifically starting with the 1964 exhibition of contemporary American ceramics that was in Kyoto and Tokyo. International. Uh, international. Um, that had a profound effect on many, many of the artists we've interviewed. They had no idea you could treat clay in these different formats. So the difference is the emphasis. Is it an emphasis on technique or is it an emphasis on personal expression? Um, and my hypothesis at the end of this is that Jeff does both. And that's what makes him unique. Um, but at this point in time, it really was kind of a battle between free expression and emotion or perfection of technique. Slide, please. As to Jeff's own work as compared to his contemporaries, Jeff followed his own path in, in, in studying in the Zen. Many Americans followed the Minge path or the folk craft path. Um, and this is represented by, by uh, Warren McKenzie. Um, uh, slide, please. And Warren uh, had been a student of Bernard Leach and Hamada Soji, and he created a, 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 a style that became known as Minge Sota. He was such an influence, influential professor with so many good, strong students that there has become a whole body of work in the Minnesota upper, upper US area um, that, there's quite a plethora of work that's now referred to as Minge Soda. And this slide is just some examples of work of those artists. And you can, and these are all from our collection. Um, slide, please. So when we look at Jeff's work, what I want to point out here is that Jeff studied technique for years. 
and then he came back and perfected it in the US. He became a master of the clay that he's talked about. I was fascinated with the slab work. He was listening to the clay. Uh, he's been a master of glaze in his own way now. He's using it in a painterly style. He's definitely a master of the kiln technique. So he's created this new innovative work that is unique because he's been able to bring together that, that level of emotion, that capturing of nature at a moment of time, the pools of light from the stream, the lichen, the glacial cliffs of the Hudson Valley. He's captured those in a moment of time and he's giving to them, giving them to us. So his new sculpture work is singularly his own and it speaks to all of us on a very visceral nature. And we thank you for that, Jeff. Thank you. Joan? Yeah, Halsey, I, I couldn't have said it even half as well as you did. You captured it perfectly and I loved your introduction. Um, and I'm thinking of our dear friend, um, uh, Mishima Kimio, when you were showing all of those uh, American works from those exhibitions in 1971-72, without which I don't think we would have Mishima doing her wonderful uh, refuse-related sculptures. And by the same token, how you tied that into Jeff's work was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my last question for Jeff. Uh, oh, by the way, everyone, as you're looking here and you're looking at these two glorious pieces, they're already sold. We, we have a limited group of, the, of masterpieces from these two new bodies. And in two and a half days, we've sold half the show. They're all great, but I encourage you, if you're inspired by this, to go online and take a look at the virtual catalog so you can see multiple views of the pieces. They're all, interestingly, they're priced. And those that are sold are already marked, so you don't have to get frustrated. Uh, but they're all really terrific, uh, of a very high level and standard across the board. So Jeff, as your final question tonight from me, although there are maybe some questions from the audience, uh, your story and your experience, both in Japan and the West, I would say are truly exceptional. And your artworks are really quite special in the ways you've absorbed and then transformed your Japanese training to create such highly original uh, works of art through the decades. Where do you see yourself going from here? How do you see your artwork going to the next level from where we are now? And how are you going to explore and develop some new concepts that may be fermenting already? Um, but basically, as far as what the future for my work has in store, I think for me, that's still to be discovered in that way. That's what keeps me excited and keeps me going. Um, I feel like if I kind of sit back on my laurels or if I know exactly what's going to happen, um, in a way, that's the beginning of an artistic, uh, very slow decline and an artistic death. So not knowing is a big part of the challenge for me. Um, and I think also that uh, it's, it's more about an attitude for me uh, rather than knowing what particular forms I'm about to make. And there's a term I just found out about recently also from Matt, our apprentice. He, um, he does a, a word of the day and occasionally he'll send me one of those. And there was one that was just perfect. Uh, it's a word, it's, it, the word is Sprezzatura, sprezzatura. It's an Italian, a very old Italian word, first appeared in 1528. And back then it was defined as um, a certain nonchalance so as to conceal all art and make whatever one does or says appear to be without effort and almost without any thought. It means basically to approach art with a simple abandonment freely and unfettered by constraints. So this is super important to me because that's where I want to be in how I approach working with clay, manipulating materials, doing the firing. Um, that's where I want to be. I want to find that five-year-old child spirit, knowing that I have the ability, understanding the tools and processes that I have available, but being able to let go. And I think that in itself is something I'll spend the rest of my life trying to achieve. So I, 
don't see that I'm ever going to get tired. Well, as they say, gambari mas. Yes, right. please. Uh, and what a wonderful world. Spreads the Torah. I can just see my next exhibition <laughs> of artists who managed to accomplish that. <laughs> Leave it to the Italians to have one word to express an entire concept. Um, but bravo, bravo, Jeff. Uh, may you long continue to expand that horizon. Thank you. Uh, my last question is for Alice, and, and the question is really because I think every single person seated here tonight in front of their screen is really ridiculously tired of not being able to travel anywhere. And none of us are going anywhere even now, any time soon. So I thought we would just turn our attention since we're talking about Sprezzo Toro in Italian to Italy. So Alice, more recently you went with Jeff to Italy. How could that happen? Tell us about your experiences on that trip and how Jeff engaged with Ceramis there as both teacher, mentor, advisor. And from your own perspective, how did you see him navigating between the two cultures, Italy, the United States, and of course, Japan? <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Halsey and I were very lucky to go with Jeff to Italy. Um, Jeff navigates beautifully between the two cultures. He is an empathetic, joyful person. He has a facility with language, words, and communication, as you've all heard. Um, but when, you're, when he's leading a group, what's amazing is how he communicates with the person he's interviewing and the group itself, that he, everybody, he's, he's aware of everybody and how they work together. It's quite an art um, that he has. Jeff is also a storyteller, which is a wonderful gift to help a group get inside a culture. Next slide. Jeff had developed personal relationships with major Italian ceramic artists, and he shared those relationships with us. It was a pleasure to meet Nino Caruso in Rome and see his work. You, you can see it here. Next slide. We arrived in Faenza, Italy, home of the International Museum of Ceramics and the museum honoring Carlo Zali, the important sculptor and artist who forged new directions in the ceramic arts. And you're seeing two works by Carlo Zali here. Um, when we went to the Zali, Zali Museum, we met the director and Jeff's friend Matteo Zali, son of Carlo Zali. Next slide. Matteo Zali personally gave us a tour of his father's museum. Jeff was fortunate to be invited to work in the Carlo Zali studio in the summer of 2012, and then invited back in 2013 for a solo exhibition in the Central Plaza. In the last two slides, there've been examples of Carlo Zali's work that are in the courtyard of the museum. Also, I wanted to note that you know, Caruso and Carlo Zali were also hugely influential on Fukame Sueharu that did the big blue blade in, our, in my first slide. Um, uh, these men had a profound influence uh, back and forth with Japanese ceramic artists. Um, so there was also an Italian Japanese um, uh, cross fertilization going on at that period of time. Back to Joan. And if, Joan, if I can just add one thing, or actually two, um, a proposal that I have out there, I actually made it a while ago for the MIC, the museum, the Ceramics Museum in Faenza, was to put together a panel and then exhibition, a cross-cultural exhibition of Italy and Japan, being that Sodesha, the breakaway uh, ceramics movement, was actually paralleled without any knowing between the two countries in Italy by Zauli and Nino Crusoe and another whole group of uh, breakaway artists in Italy. Um, so maybe that'll still have a chance somewhere in the future to, to happen. But it's, it's quite interesting that these mm. movements were going on at the same time. The perfect museum in Japan is Shigaraki. That's just the kind of show that Shigaraki, Shigaraki Toge no Mori loves. And I could see that as an international traveling show be fantastic. Oh. 
So that was my last question. Thank you all. Um, we have a few questions. We asked for questions ahead of time. And uh, for the moment, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chelsea, who I think there are a, co a couple questions have already been answered since they were pre sent in. Uh, but there were a couple that haven't been answered. So Chelsea, can I ask you to present those to our panel? Absolutely. Jeff, the question for you. <laughs> Jeff, the question for you is a participant at one of your recent, um, when they were visiting your kiln, she recently saw you call two T-bowls before they were fired and was wondering if you might ex expound upon the criteria of form and how you make the judgment of what you choose to fire and what you choose to not. Um, okay, so let me just understand. This person was seeing me culling work as it came out of the kiln? Before it went into the kiln. At okay. Your shop. So actually, I've just been putting up some Instagram posts. If anybody's interested in following that, um, Jeff Shapiro sixty two. But <laughs> recently, I put up a post about culling. So in people, all putters have different approaches to how they work. Uh, for me, it's a matter of making spontaneous pieces and then selecting from those as to the ones that have the movement, the spontaneity that I'm looking for. So it's a little bit like comparing, um, say, free jazz to classical music. So I'll make maybe a series of cups that are kind of funky looking, um, but they have to have the right movement. So it's hard to put in words exactly what that movement is. I think for a musician, it would be the same thing. And so you wouldn't be able to say, well, why did that piece work? I mean, it, if it works, it works. Um, but there's a large part of the process is involved in culling all along the way. When the piece is made, once the pieces are trimmed, uh, when they're ready to go into a firing, and of course, once they come out of the fire. Beautiful, thank you. We have a question that just came in via the chat. Jeff, what temperature do you fire to and what is the main flux in your white glaze? If you're willing uh, well, to share your secrets. Yeah, uh, it's not a secret. I mean, I. I don't think I have actually secrets. Um, you know, again, each potter has, or each artist, each potter mm -hmm. has their own way of working, but um, it's basically a feldspathic glaze, uh, translucent feldspathic glaze. There are many of them out there. It's more about the, um, it's not being spoon fed, spoon fed information. It's really about running with an idea or a process and experimenting and finding different ways of using it that satisfy the concept that you have in mind. So it really isn't, I mean, if that person wants to write, I'd be happy to give them the recipe. I don't have it on hand right now, but it, that really isn't the answer. It's just the short, the short answer. Great. Does that make sense? Or do they think they want a, a more involved answer to that? I think that, that's great. We can reach out for further questions okay. I can connect yeah. you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and one final question from our audience, because as Joan said, everything else has been answered thus far, unless anyone would like to submit something to the chat. Um, Jeff, our question comes from someone who saw you and Suzuki Goro at an event, and someone asked what technique Goro was using. You said it's the Goro technique, and you said it's Goro, he's beyond technique. So the question to you, Jeff, is do you believe that you are beyond technique or do you think that one ever gets beyond technique? All right, we probably need a couple of hours to answer. <laughs> um, and, I'm, and I'm not sure that's exactly mm -hmm. how the answer from me came out, but it was probably something close mm -hmm. to that. Sure. Um, Goro, for those of you who don't know, uh, Suzuki Goro, he's a very special artist, ceramic artist who does a lot of oribe, but he does many other techniques. Uh, he's developed styles of his own. He is uh, one of a kind. Um, so whatever he does, whether it, it, he's prolific, uh, he's not afraid of anything. One of the comments he once made to me that stuck was I visited many, many, many times. He's been here and worked in my studio. Um, I fired work of his in my kiln, but visiting him the thing he told me that was so impressive was that I said, you make these little tiny sake cups, sometimes really minuscule. And he makes these huge, huge vessels. I mean, they can be seven feet across, four feet high, four feet wide. Um, 
it's amazing that he can go from these tiny things to these large things. And I had asked him once if he has to go like, is it left brain, right brain? Does he change his, his approach? And he said, no, no, it's exactly the same. If I'm making a tiny sake cup or a huge vessel, I always have the feeling that I have a mountain of clay at my back. And that's how he works, you know, thinking that this image of this huge, huge pile of clay, whether it's a tiny piece or a huge piece, the approach is the same. And as far as me, personally, um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it's kind of a hard question. Technique, I think we all need to have technique. Again, if we give the comparison of, say, classical music to, to free jazz, um, I think people Every once in a while, you get somebody who perhaps can just start out from the beginning and be free and loose, spontaneous. But basically, same with free jazz, learning jazz, you need to know the basics and the structure. And then from there on, it's a matter of letting go, as I mentioned in one of the previous questions. So no, I don't think you do it without technique. You need technique, but you don't want to become a slave to technique. That's the difference. Wonderful. And one final question that just came into the chat. Jeff, were you able to participate in the kiln unloading after that first firing of the Suzaki's kiln? And what were your impressions of your first wood fire kiln unloading? Mm. That's a good one. That's kind of forcing my memory to, to see how <laughs> far back I can go. Um, I don't know that it was actually that firing, but there were a number of firings and unloadings that I was there for. This kiln that I I referred to with Isazaki June happened to be his Nobodigama, which is a multi-chambered climbing kiln. He also has a, a very long and narrow Anagama, a tunnel kiln. I've been there for the results of, of both. Um, and was the last part of the question, how that influenced me or affected me or what was the last part? Yes, what were your impressions and what oh. the loading, first unloading, what do you- Yeah, well, it was, it was super, it had a very, very strong impression. I mean, again, seeing for the first time these, these effects that I'd never seen in any other pottery. What you produce from a, a wood-fired kiln on unglazed surfaces is quite actually incredible. It's actually, a, there's a science involved to this whole thing, what's happening chemically. But uh, artistically, it was just beyond my, my understanding. It was just overwhelming in a good way. Um, and yeah, I mean, seeing that, understanding how important the act and the process of loading. Most people who fire here tend to want to get to the firing, get to the good stuff. But it's actually the loading of a, of a large wood-fired kiln that creates all the patterns. Firings create the surfaces, loading creates all the patterns. That was it. Thank, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> okay. uh, I learned even more from these questions uh, and more <laughs> insight into your work. Uh, thank you, panelists for I think a really illuminating hour we've spent together. It's been terrific and a joy and a personal joy to be working with all three of you. Thank you very Same much. Here. Same here, thanks. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Next coming up is um, uh, Rose Sanjin, who's the, the predecessor of all of this, if you will, and his circle of immensely talented uh, future uh, Ningen Kokoho Living National Treasures. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And uh, last slide, I just want to take the opportunity to wish everyone a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, we need to remember um, these special events as we are cloistered within our little family units. And I just thought this wonderful work by Akiyama Yo sort of says it all about uh, the possibilities of clay and what they can evoke. So thank you all. I hope to see you again soon, whether on a computer screen or actually in our gallery by appointment. Thank you for coming and good night to you all. Good night, thanks. Thank you.